Hello, my name is Dr. Daniel Kremens, and I'm an Associate Professor of Neurology and the Co-Director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Program at Sydney Kimmel Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And today we're going to be talking about building blocks, early recognition, assessment, and treatment of Parkinson's disease psychosis. And with me today, I have two participants, Dr. Rajesh Pawa. Dr. Pawa, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm Rajesh Pawa. I'm professor of neurology and division chair for Parkinson's disease and movement disorders at the University of Kansas Medical Center, Kansas City, Kansas. And Dr. Isaacson? Hi, I'm Stuart Isaacson. I'm the director of the Parkinson's disease and movement disorders center of Boca Raton and Boca Raton, Florida. Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease in the world, affecting about a million people in the United States. And it's thought that up to 50% of people will develop Parkinson's disease psychosis at some point during the course of their illness. Despite the fact that Parkinson's disease psychosis is so common, it's under-recognized and often patients won't discuss it at visits. So we know that early recognition and assessment is critical for treatment of Parkinson's disease psychosis. So Raj, how do you make that early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease psychosis? So I think it's very important to get an understanding of PD psychosis from the patient and especially the caregiver right from the time they have the diagnosis of Parkinson's because PD psychosis can begin at any time during the disease course. So what I personally recommend is while the patient is waiting in the nursing, I'm sorry, in the waiting room or in the room for the physician to come in, that they, they fill a simple question saying that, are they seeing things that are not there? Or they do they feel there are things out there that other people might be thinking? Or do they believe certain things that may not be true? And I ask both the patient and the caregiver to look over these questions and to complete them. If both of them say no, I don't even go into that question. But if one of them says yes, then I go a little deeper when I see the patient trying to get a better feel of what exactly is going on. Are they seeing patients? Do they believe certain things are going on? Because that gives me a better idea how bad they may be. Because if someone says, oh, I saw uh, an animal one month ago for a few seconds and never seen it again, that doesn't concern me as opposed to someone saying they're seeing a dog every day, all the time, and the dog is bothering them. So that, that definitely is something I do an evaluation to find out how severe or bothersome it may be. Well, I think that uh, the fact that you use this simple question pre the examination might be a really key way for us to make the diagnosis early because you know, patients often don't volunteer the information unless you specifically ask them. And why would that be if it's so common? Well, some people believe that it's related to the fact that patients may be frightened or embarrassed uh, that if they confess that they're having these sort of things, uh, you know, they may not be believed or they might be thought that they're crazy. Another issue is some patients don't associate it with their Parkinson's disease. They don't realize I had one patient who was seeing things on the wall and kept going to the optometrist to get his glasses adjusted. So there are many reasons why patients don't, uh, you know, volunteer this. And if we don't ask these specific questions, we may not uh, find out. The other thing is so much of the visit is often spent on motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the tremor, the gait problems. And as a result, sometimes, particularly given the press that we have now on seeing patients and the time limitations, we simply just don't ask about these other non-motor symptoms. Stu, what approach do you have to making early recognition? Well, I think it's important to recognize that Parkinson's psychosis uh, can begin quite early in the disease. Uh, it may not be with delusions. It may be mild hallucinations. It could also be illusions uh, where there's a stimulus that's misperceived, a tree that looks like a person, for instance, uh, or a sense of presence or passage uh, where you feel someone's in the room or someone's moving behind you. But you never know if patients are experiencing these, these things unless you ask. And it's why we really advocate for asking about it in the same way that we ask about a tremor or a constipation or lightheadedness or how do you sleep at night or how's your memory? Do you ever see things that aren't there? Just by asking about it in a non-stigmatizing way can really be helpful, I think, to elicit 
uh, for patients who are experiencing these symptoms, uh, whether they're having them uh, currently and how frequent they are and how severe they are, and to really assess the insight they have into whether these things are real or, or not real. So, you know, when we conduct clinical studies, we often use uh, validated measurement scales. And one of these things is called the SAPS PD or the scale for the assessment of positive symptoms. And this is what's been used in some of the psychosis studies. But, you know, this really isn't necessarily practical in the, uh, when we're seeing patients. So what ways do you have to assess a patient for their psychosis when you're seeing them in a regular clinic visit as opposed to a study visit? Right. So me personally, I, I really talk to the patient and try to get an understanding. Uh, like I said, if someone says, oh, I see something once in a while, or I believe there's a bunch of clothes present and I think there are kids sitting on there, uh, it's not a big issue. The patient pretty much has an insight. Similarly, if the hallucinations are present, does the patient feel that these are real or not? And if the patient says, yeah, I see some dogs, but I know you have talked taught me over the time that medications can cause it, my disease can cause it. I know it's not real. Uh, I look away and look back and it's gone. Again, it's it's not an issue. So for me, that's still mild. Then we come to the part where the hallucinations can become bothersome for the patient, that the dog is there all the time and, and it's beginning to annoy them. Uh, you know, even if the insight is still there that the patient knows it's not real, to me, that's something I would like to consider treating it. Uh, then you have patients where they have lost the insight and this dog is there. They, they really are scared of it. They have people in the house. They're trying to feed the people. They're believing the spouse is stealing from them, having an affair, which to me would be really a significant issue, which may require more of an urgent treatment from that part. So the, for me, it's like, no, it's not present. Maybe it's mild. Maybe it's mild, but not bothersome. Getting to a moderate part and then severe which would require immediate attention from my part. So one thing I think is important that I always keep in mind is that, you know, there really is no such thing as a benign hallucination. We know now, Chris Getz did a wonderful study several years back where they looked at 48 patients who had hallucinations but still had insight, and they followed them for three years. And at the end of the three years, only two patients uh, had not progressed to the point where they had lost insight or had uh, or had developed delusions. And I think what this study demonstrates is that once these hallucinations start in the vast majority of people, they're gonna continue and they get worse. So my threshold to treat may actually be a little earlier because I like to get on top of it before the patient's getting the delusions or thinking that someone's breaking in their house and now they're calling 911. Stu, what are your thoughts? Well, I think I, think I agree with you because very often once the patients begin to experience even infrequent or, or even mild uh, symptoms, it begins to uh, translate into our treatment paradigm for treating motor symptoms becomes constricted. And we become more hesitant, I think, to increase or adjust medication. So even mild infrequent emergence of psychosis symptoms of illusions or presence, hallucinations, impact how we treat our patients motor-wise. And once a patient with Parkinson's develop psychosis, we no longer treat their motor symptoms as, as well, I think. We, we begin to not increase the medicine and, and actually sometimes to begin to decrease the medicine. And this impacts their motor symptoms, increasing the risk of falls, impairing their quality of life and, and such. So it's very important to assess early and, and to try to uh, treat it uh, early as well. So I think we've learned today that Parkinson's disease psychosis is a very common problem in Parkinson's disease, but it can be addressed, and it can be addressed through early assessment, early recognition, and then allowing us to treat the patient, because we're going to end up in a therapeutic bind, as you point out, Dr. Isaacson. We're left with treating the psychosis, we're treating the movement, and we start balancing those, and that can lead to that therapeutic bind where we end up under treating both of them. So I wanna thank my uh, co-participants today for your insights on building blocks, early recognition, assessment, and treatment of Parkinson's disease psychosis. Thank you. Thank you.